I helped integrate some work that originated from Netflix to do offloaded TLS in the kernel. And I've extended that to work with um, one of my other folks I work with is a company called Chelsea, um, and they make some NICs that are able to do TLS offload in the NIC itself. So I took some work, the work from Netflix, um, extended it a bit to work with a TLS offload inside of NICs as opposed to TLS offload using software inside the kernel. Um, I work to integrate the framework for kernel TLS into the kernel. Um, and then I've since extended a few more to handle uh, TLS receive. Uh, Netflix's traffic model is really focused more on TX offload. So TLS and offload in the kernel in 13 supports both send and receive. And that's been kind of neat to work on. So I also started working with our in-kernel crypto cryptographic framework that's used for things like Jelly for disk encryption, as well as for IPsec. Um, I worked on some drivers for that. Um, I also worked on, and then as I worked on some drivers, I got some experience working with our framework and found that, um, especially for driver authors, maybe not so, matter, so much a matter of performance, but for driver authors, it was a little clunky to work with some of the data structures, a lot of the boilerplate you had to do. Um, and then I also did some work to kind of rototill the data structures, make it a little more friendly to work with from a developer's perspective. And also have made the framework kind of more friendly to extending to other things. So I added several different features to it that made it a lot more amenable to better performance with KTLS, for example. As part of my research with on Cherry with the folks at Cambridge, I've worked um, with our MIPS port and our RISC-V ports, which we currently support Cherry on, as well as some, some recent work on our ARM64 port. Um, related to MIPS and RISC-V specifically, I helped do some of the work to get those architectures moved on to Clang and LLVM as their default tool chain, which helped with our effort overall on FreeBSD of finally retiring um, ancient GPL v2 tool chains, both Benutils and GCC. So I'm really excited that 13 gets to ship with a modern tool chain for all of our architectures out of the box. And we've finally moved on and not being held back by ancient tool chains. Uh, I know other, we had a whole, right before the 13 release, we had a whole big batch of patches come in to support uh, HID devices over I squared C, which is a lot of touchpads and newer laptops that I didn't work on at all. And my laptop is old enough that it still works okay without that, but that's gonna open up even more devices off the shelf, kind of for what I call the Costco test of, you know, how many devices at Costco will just run FreeBSD okay. And so kind of as a project and not really me, but as, as core team and as developers um, over the last several years, we've shifted our focus. We've really tried to say FreeBSD is targeted at kind of widely used server and desktop systems um, and also some embedded board systems. Uh, but we're not going to try to run on every single architecture. We're going to try to pick um, commonly used, widely used architectures and run on those as well as we can. And trying to, to narrow our focus to be what are the things that we are capable of doing well and not kind of distracting our developer resources, supporting things that just aren't widely as widely used in our community. I think with are, are changing our focus on what architectures and even what device drivers and things we're going to support, trying to look towards things that are future facing. What are our users going to be using in the future? Not so much looking towards the past. Um, and even our migration from conversion to get all these things together kind of tie into, for me, this, this kind of picture or this theme of looking towards the future. So that's really kind of what I see in terms of FreeBSD 13 and, and our development even over the last couple of years. In the last core team, uh, we were looking at industry trends. And one of them was um, a very clear migration to Git. Um, this migration has been going on for a number of years in the industry. Um, so the project decided to take a serious look at whether it was time for the project to migrate or if that was something we even were interested in. Looking at uh, Git, one of the big advantages was that it allowed us to uh, have better merges. Um, it also allows us to uh, develop remotely. You can have local changes that you um, go through debugging cycles on, go through iteration to, to make the changes better. Most of our developers uh, these days uh, know Git. Uh, most of our would-be contributors know Git. They learn Git in school. They learn Git in at their jobs. We don't have to teach them Git. Um, Subversion so has become kind of a backwater uh, source code control system. People are still using it. Some large projects are still using it. Uh, but as a whole, um, and there are a few exceptions, but you know, as a whole, the industry has moved on to, to Git and in the longer term um, to you know, make 
developing for FreeBSD um, easier, make supporting the stable branches easier, um, make um, make it reduce a lot of the friction in, a, in the developer's life so that they can focus more on producing the thing that they're interested in and less on the mechanics of doing the thing that they're interested in. Uh, I've also been working on changes to uh, the NVMe driver to make it more efficient. In addition to that, um, I've been doing uh, some janitorial work uh, in the project uh, to um, retire a number of really old drivers that um, nobody had thought about for years, but whenever we would do um, try to do improvements to different subsystems, to SCSI, um, to CAM, to the, the network, um, they would get in the way because they're, they're old hardware, they're impossible to test, and they use all these weird interfaces that generally you don't need for modern hardware. And so uh, anytime there was a change, there was a big tax on the change for the, all this legacy hardware that uh, might not even still work. And if it did, there are so few users that there's not a big benefit to, to the project. Um, so I'd like to also give a shout out to Matt Macy and all the people at IX Systems. Um, they've been very instrumental in uh, rebasing our ZFS sources from Illumos to the Open ZFS project. So I've been working on a number of things that will turn up in 13. Uh, there's, a, there's an ongoing background activity of general bug fixing and minor improvements in PF. Uh, the first one is an improvement to IF Bridge, and that work was sponsored by the FreeBSD Foundation. And we got uh, fairly substantial performance improvements out of that. Uh, off the top of my head, we saw 450-ish percent improvement in, in uh, specific test setups. So uh, one thing that you can expect is that the bridge code will be significantly faster. A second bit of performance work uh, was around PF, which is ostensibly the major part of the work I do in FreeBSD. Uh, and that's also a performance improvement and is, is actually substantially simpler than the performance work that was done on the bridge code. This is not a locking rework. This is just uh, count differently. And there, you know, depending on hardware setup, we saw an improvement of about 100%. So doubling the number of packets that it can process. I think these, these performance improvements are attractive because they demonstrate that, hey, FreeBSD is keeping up with modern hardware. Uh, it's not just something that you run on, you know, on, on your, old, uh, your old desktop machine that you use as a home uh, gateway device. FreeBSD really can scale up to uh, you know, significantly large and intensive deployments. Uh, I have, in not recently, but last year certainly, uh, done uh, done a fair bit of work on Risk Five. You know, thirteen is also, uh, I think, yeah, essentially the first release where we will have significant support for Risk Five systems. Tagline for thirteen, from my perspective at least, is is simply faster. 